name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Listen to God's word again from Mark chapter 1, beginning with verse 12. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. This is God's word. We know what temptation feels like. It's pretty common in our everyday lives. Maybe it's the 11.30 at night as you stare into the glow of the refrigerator and you know that it's time to go to bed, but one more snack, one more thing. And sometimes you can resist and close it and have your self-control, but, but sometimes just a taste. Maybe that's just me. Um, kids, you know what it's like to be tempted to as you're in school and, and someone's getting laughed at or, or there's, there's a joke made about somebody and, and you know that it's, it's mean but sometimes you kind of laugh along to fit in. And there's temptation and we fall into it. We know the temptations to love the things that God gives us more than him, more than the giver. We saw that in the the lesson from Abraham, where, where God calls him to give up the, the one thing that, that could pull him away from God, his love for his son, his one, his only son, the promised son. God needed to, to show him that he was all that he needed. We know what it's like to face temptation. Thankfully, Jesus knew what it was like to face temptation, too. Thankfully, Jesus came and he faced temptation from Satan in your place as your substitute. He came and he fought a battle, a battle against death and against hell and against Satan. But it's different than the battle we face against temptation. <laughs> because so often we fail, we lose. But Jesus came to proclaim good news. He came to proclaim that he had defeated Satan and that the kingdom of God was near. We're back at the beginning of Mark. This section of God's word happens right after Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit had come down on him in the form of the dove, and God the Father himself has, has proclaimed, I endorse everything that Jesus is going to do. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. His ministry in our place as our substitute, as our Savior, was about to begin. And how does that ministry begin? Immediately, the Spirit drives him out into the desert. And there he is for 40 days being tempted by Satan. The other gospel accounts give us the expanded version of showing all the temptations, or at least three examples of the temptations that Satan gave to Jesus. But here in Mark, we're just given the picture that Jesus goes out into the desert, away from a support system, to go battle Satan one-on-one. -on -one. And it doesn't even say at the end, and, and Jesus won, and it was over, because it's really a picture for us that Jesus' entire ministry was going out and wrestling against and fighting against Satan and his temptations. That was a promise God had made that a champion would come, that a champion would struggle against the devil, against the serpent, against the one who had defeated mankind, who, who had pushed them away from their savior, that a champion would come and he would crush his head. 
back in the garden, back in Eden, where people had everything, good relationships with God, good relationships with each other, opportunities for meaningful service, and they threw it all away because they believed the lie, they believed the temptation that Satan could get them the things they need and that God wasn't telling them the truth and didn't care about them. So he sent the, the child of the woman, the, the true man, to stand as a substitute in our place. To go head to head with the devil once and for all. We don't have the picture of what all these temptations were like for Jesus out in the wilderness. But we know that the all-powerful one had for a time given up use of his power and his strength. So here he was. He, he wasn't eating and drinking in the wilderness. He was weak. He was tired. And Satan came to him and tempted him to trust him instead of God the Father to trust that there was an easier way than going to a cross and dying for the sins of the world. Instead, he could rule, he could bring his kingdom into existence in a different way, just, just a little bit of bowing, just, just a little bit of going off course. And it would be fine. It would be okay. It would be way easier. And the writer of the Hebrews tells us that Jesus suffered the same temptations that we do. He stands in our place with one difference. How long do we hold out against the temptations of Satan? How long can we bear up under the temptations that this world has to offer and start before we start to believe that they have something to offer that's better than what God has to offer? How long can we resist the temptations that come from sin that lives within us and battles our new man? Perhaps for a time we do. But our temptation never reaches the full effect that Jesus' temptation did because after a time we can resist and resist and resist. But eventually it gets too tough and we do fail and we do fall so much of the time. <laughs> Through God's word, some temptations are not as tough for us because God strengthens us through his word. But Satan seems to find another one that we forgot about before too long. What are the temptations that, that he tempts you with that too often you give in to? Is it, is it simply the, the time wasters when you could be serving your family, serving someone else, studying God's word, but instead you're, you're scrolling down on the phone or, or spending time on the computer? Is it, is it just one more click on, on sites that you know no Christian should be looking at? Is it criticism of, of family members, friends, or coworkers so that, so that you can really show them who's in charge or belittle them so that we feel better about ourselves. For you, maybe anger is a temptation. And, and sometimes we can just say, ah, oh, you know what, I've got, I've got a short fuse, and, and we, just, we just set it aside, not realizing that anger in God's eyes and hatred is equated with, with murder, and that too is breaking his holy law. Maybe it's the sarcasm or the passive-aggressive comments that, that Satan uses to, to tempt you into sin. Maybe like Abraham, it, it's, it's putting good things and, and making them God things, making them more important than God. Family, friends, work, wealth. Jesus was tempted with these things too. But unlike this, us, he had no sinful nature inside of him. Instead, Satan and the outside world just 
dove upon him and tempted him with everything they had. But he got so much farther than the point where we would break down, where we would crumble and make it easier again. Instead, for every day of his life, every day of his ministry, he stood up underneath the temptations of Satan so that he could be the true, holy, perfect lamb that God would provide. In our section from from God's word with Abraham, Abraham didn't know how God would do it. He knew that he loved God more, more than anything, but he trusted God that he would keep his promise too. God had promised him him this son, this only son, through whom the entire world would be blessed. And and Abraham realized that even if he had to bring him back from the dead, God would keep his promise. That he would get to keep his son, his only son, the son who he loved. And God provided a substitute. His son did not die, but this ram in the thicket that God gave, he died in his place as his sacrifice. Jesus came and he went to battle against Satan in our place as our substitute, where we should fall and fall away from God and do exactly what Satan wants of tearing us from God's kingdom into his kingdom with his lies and his empty promises, God came as our substitute and stood in our place and never, ever gave in. He was our substitute in his perfect life, but that wasn't all. He came not not just to resist the devil, but to crush the devil and his work with, with Jesus' life and Jesus' work. He came... And he also died the death that we deserve. And on the cross at Calvary, he crushed Satan. He took away all of his power over us by opening his kingdom and stopping the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of Satan. By giving the final blow to Satan. All because he knew he would rise. All because he knew he would die for our sins. But he was our substitute in his death. You can picture, how is a snake going to hurt you if you're stepping on it? He would bite his heel. That was the prophecy from from Genesis. And it too would be a fatal blow. That Jesus, after standing up against Satan for so long, it would appear that he failed. As the venom of sin pulsed through his body as he took on all of our sins, all of our failures to stand up under temptation. But the poison of sin running through Jesus' body wasn't what killed him on the cross. He gave up his spirit because it was finished. Because he took all the sin into himself and he died so that you would never have to. So that no one can accuse you, like we read in the, in the lesson from, from Romans. No one can stand up and, and say, you are guilty of sin. You can't be in God's presence because Jesus declares you innocent. He was guilty so that you can be innocent. And that, friends, is good news. And Jesus went and he proclaimed the good news. Good news for us to hear. Good news that he's defeated Satan. Good news that he's given us his word so that we can continue to resist, so that we can continue to fight the battle against Satan. Because those temptations are not going to stop this side of heaven. But he gives us his word, he gives us his promises that, that he will allow us to stand up against those temptations and that when we fall, he'll forgive us every time. So we come to, this, come to him in this pattern of, of repentance and forgiveness. But we know the good news. We know that he defeated the devil, and we know that the kingdom of God was here. At the cross, Satan might have thought that his kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, had just won as darkness fell over the land for hours as Jesus actually died. 
But the truth was that he had been defeated and the kingdom of God was drawing nearer and nearer, pushing back the gates of hell. Jesus proclaimed it. Jesus fulfilled it. The kingdom of God is near. One of the reasons that we have purple during Lent is to remind us that Jesus is a royal king, the color of royalty. But Jesus' kingdom marches on in a different way than Satan's kingdom does. Jesus' kingdom comes as the word is proclaimed, as we learn his word and as we share it with others. His kingdom uh, takes over the hearts of people and changes them from darkness and unbelief to victory and life and light. And Jesus promised that in his person and in his work, the kingdom of God was near. And it is still near today. His kingdom doesn't come like Satan. Satan's is by tempting to distrust God. But surprisingly, Jesus' kingdom doesn't even come by him coming and forcing people to be his subjects. Jesus' kingdom comes exactly how he said it would. Repentance and belief in the good news. Jesus will never force you to believe. He will never force you to follow him. Instead, through, through the word read in your Bible at home, through, through the word learned in a Bible study, through the word proclaimed from the pulpit, through the word tasted and felt and seen in Holy Communion, God's kingdom comes. <laughs> as he strengthens faith, as he convinces the unconvinced, his kingdom comes with a whisper. Not a demand, but a whisper that he points, look what I've done for you. That child that was promised to come and defeat Satan, that child in the manger, that's me. I've come for you. I've come to, to woo you and win you back like, like a husband calling out to his bride and saying, I love you. Come and be with me. He calls to us and says, I've, I've stood up against every temptation so that even though you struggle and sometimes you're failing, you have not failed because I've won the victory. At the cross, I took all your sins into myself so that I could bury them deep in the grave. And that's not the best part. The best part comes on Easter when the grave is empty, when your sins remain, and I've forgiven all of them. Jesus came because he knew he was going to die. He knew he was going to rise. And he was there to proclaim that good news. He's defeated Satan. Amen.